Good afternoon. I'm going to call to order this meeting of the uh, Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights, and Engagement Committee. I'm the vice chair of the committee. And chair Cunningham is uh, out on vacation today, so I'll be chairing the meeting. I'm joined by council members Cano, Schrader, and Johnson. And that's a quorum, so we can conduct our business. Thanks, committee members, for being here. Um, we have one public hearing, three consent items, and a discussion item. I think just in case there's staff here for the consent items, I'm going to take those first. And then we'll take a brief report on our public hearing, which is on the Neighborhood and Community Engagement Commission. So the consent items include a grant from the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District for street outreach, a public health advisory committee appointment, and a Minneapolis Workforce Advisory Committee appointment, actually two appointments. Mm -hmm. Would anybody like to pull any of those items for discussion? Seeing nobody wishing to do so, I will move those three consent items forward for approval. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. Well, those carry. So now we'll move on to our public hearing, and I think that we will um, start with a brief uh, staff presentation. And this is a uh, hearing on our Neighborhood Community Engagement Commission appointments. This is one of the uh, commissions where we actually have a public hearing as part of the resolution. And we're going to have uh, Ms. Brodeen give a little uh, presentation, and then I'll open the public hearing. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair Gordon and committee members. My name is Cheyenne Brodeen, and I am the Internal Services Manager in the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department. I am before you today to present uh, three appointments to the Neighborhood and Community Engagement Commission. Uh, two are City Council appointments, and one is a mayoral appointment. Uh, the two City Council appointments are Jeffrey Strand, Ward 4, and Queen Kimmins of Ward 5. And the mayoral appointee is uh, Mary Dedu Swinton. The Neighborhood and Community Engagement Commission advises the Mayor, City Council, and the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department on a wide range of community engagement issues. Um, one of the major responsibilities that the Commission has had over the past years has been uh, providing recommendations to the NCR Department, Mayor, and Council on neighborhood funding programs. Uh, into the, looking into the future, one of the big pieces of work that they will be advising um, uh, the city on is uh, Neighborhoods 2020, the future of funding for neighborhood organizations beyond the year 2020. Uh, in the past, they have also provided uh, input and recommendations to the city on broaden broadening participation on boards and commissions, as well as um, developing um, the One Minneapolis Fund program, which is a, a funding program that uh, offers small grants to local nonprofits to further the city's engagement work. Um, there are um, 16 members on the body. Eight of them are appointed by the mayor, city council, and park board, and the other eight are selected by neighborhood organizations. And as per the enabling resolution of the body, there is a public hearing required for uh, the appointments. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions at this time, so um, you can sit down. And I'll open the public hearing. We'll see if anybody is here to speak on this matter. Is anybody signed in? Would anybody like to address the committee about this? Step forward and state your name and your address if you're, if you're willing. And Hi, my name is David Boyd, and I'm, I'm actually a commissioner in the first district of NCEC, which is North Minneapolis. And I am objecting to one of our uh, commissioners who are is being who's up for reappointment, due to the fact that this commissioner has missed over a third of our general commission meetings, and and has also has missed many many committee meetings. And I don't feel it's right that this person is being reappointed when there are other uh, commissioners who have not who have attended multiple, multiple meetings and have basically missed nothing and are not being reappointed and who are highly, highly qualified for that position. Um, I feel it's an injustice to the city and an injustice to our communities that this person is being reappointed. And I'm referring to a Commissioner uh, Melita Kimmins, who has missed over a third. And I do have uh, copies of the attendance report 
um, for this past year, and I can provide also provide copies of her attendance record for the year prior uh, during the, her two-year term, if requested by you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else here who wishes to speak on this matter? Hello, Hi. my name is Marcia Mariani, and I'm from the Cooper neighborhood. I'm a charter member of the Neighborhood and Community Engagement Commission. And I am aware that we have a very open process whereby neighborhoods select and elect their people to the commission, their representatives. The establishing resolution indicated that all the elections shall be held in the manner by which neighborhoods hold their elections. Many neighborhoods are different in that regard. I didn't expect my election to have um, NCR involvement during the day of the election, where the door I was asked to leave as a candidate, and the door was shut for discussion. That door should have remained open. I should have been able to remain in the room. The result was solved. I was put back into position. The question I have is, why did that happen? NCR should not be involved in neighborhood elections, at least not to that degree. And NCR director informed us months ago that Cedar Riverside had been decertified, and yet Cedar Riverside representative showed up to elect me. So my question is, what is the status of my neighborhood in District 8 for Cedar Riverside? Also, because our elections are so very public, the NRP had always had an open process. Now, with regard to your appointment process, we're in the dark, and we'd like you to help us out here. I know that years ago, Elizabeth Glidden was on a committee that did make the appointments. Do you still have that committee? Who are the members? How is the appointment made? Do you have a process? We'd like answers to those questions. It's not very difficult, I don't think, but we would really like to have answers. Thank you very much. I'll see if there's anybody else who wishes to speak, and then we can try to answer the questions that have been raised. Welcome. Thank you. Jeff Strand, 5100 Thomas Avenue North, Shingle Creek Neighborhood, Board 4. Um, I'm here just to thank you for your consideration of my appointment. I noticed that on the online documentation, I just wanted to say that it's less of a resume uh, my seeking reappointment is not a retrospective action. Rather, as stated in the reasons I want to serve, I have a deep 25-year-plus background in neighborhood organizations, both as a neighborhood board chair, director, NRP policy board member, and NCC member. However, I think this is a time of change, and I'm very interested in being part of the change process that we are embarking upon. I have the skills, I have the training in IAP2, I have the training in technology of participation and art of hosting. And I think that I have the deep and abiding commitment to serve the city, the residents, and improve this process. So I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak on this matter? Seeing no one then, I'll uh, close the public hearing. Um, I can speak a little bit about the process because I was involved in it in terms of making the selection. Um, I can't speak about necessarily the attendance of commissioners, um, but the um, there was a committee that formed or a task force. It included three council offices and staff from the department. And we looked at all the uh, applications and we reviewed them and discussed them. 
and made the selection that way based on criteria that we had. And I have to say it was actually especially difficult and it was odd this time because we had um, what looked to us like a dedicated group of uh, people seeking reappointment who had committed time and energy and were bringing um, assets and benefits to the commission, at least it was our understanding. Um, and so it was difficult. Uh, usually when there's somebody who's been um, doing a good job on a border commission and they reapply, it's, it's um, we're, we're not faced with too many people wanting to reapply. So that did make it rather difficult and challenging for us and we had to look at um, lots of the aspects and how that would fit in and how that would work. I have to say that it didn't necessarily reflect on anybody who wasn't chosen either. It was it was difficult um, decision. Council Member Schrader and Council Member Cunningham were the other council offices that were involved in it. And so if you want to add anything, you can go ahead. Um, we might want to hear from staff and see if the process, if there is more vetting that was done in terms of the process or anything like that. Um, and and. And you might also want to help answer some of the questions about the neighborhood elections. I'm not so knowledgeable about what would have happened there. It didn't surprise me that staff might come and try to help facilitate. I will note that Cedar Riverside neighborhood, um, there's a big question mark about neighborhood. Two groups applied to, for, for recognition. Um, there's been a lot of difficulty getting either of the boards to actually meet, convene meetings, have minutes, keep a website active. Um, so I believe, and I can't speak because it's the director's call and maybe the commission even knows more, but I can't really speak about um, decertification. I think that there's yet to, to make a selection about what neighborhood's going to qualify to participate in the CPP funding next round, but maybe staff can also help answer that question. I have been uh, in communication with Council Member Warsami, who's also a council member who serves actually probably more of the uh, neighborhood than I do. Um, and we're trying to see how we can help as a city council um, kind of regroup and help them go through a process so that they could form perhaps a new or emerged, was my hope, um, entity that would do the work. But um, Cheyenne, would you like to add anything to my people attempts to answer those difficult and challenging questions? Uh, Vice Chair Gordon, committee members, I can add a little more clarity um, to the election process. Uh, for um, the resident who spoke and also um, can address the issue around the appointments process. Um, I'll start with that one. Um, our role at NCR is just to coordinate the applications, organize the, convene the group of uh, the selection committee amongst the council members and their staff. Um, we did not vet applications prior to that meeting and put together the list of applicants and the applications for the council members. That was the extent of our role. Um, and as to the um, election process for neighborhood organizations, similar to what we do for the council office, we administer the process, collect the applications, um, and abide, follow the, there's actually election rules that the neighborhoods organize and determine themselves. So we follow that process and um, we don't facilitate the elections. We uh, bring in the League of Women Voters to do that. So that is actually um, in the election rules that the neighborhood organizations outline. Do the candidates leave the room for a discussion? Um, is that part of the rules? Um, I, so my understanding from that was uh, there was a conflict of interest raised um, so neighborhood organizations send electors, and um, one of the electors was the husband, uh, the husband of one of the candidates, and um, the group decided to either allow it or not allow it, and the candidates were asked to leave the room. Was my understanding? So okay. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question on the attendance concerns that were raised in sure. the public hearing. Does NCEC have specific rules about that where an individual is removed automatically? Does NCEC have the authority to remove their own members due to attendance concerns? How is that handled today? Sure. Uh, Vice Chair Gordon, uh, Council Member Johnson. Um, so, Actually, my records for that individual commission member, uh, she's missed three out of the 12 last year 
of meetings, so that's 25%, uh, less than one third. And that is what um, the bylaws call for. So you can miss, you can't miss more than three um, committee meetings in a one year cycle. And um, the NCEC does not unselect their members. They could recommend to the appointing authorities um, any member that they think maybe should be unseated. So for uh, members who are appointed, it would be the mayor and or city council. And then for the neighborhood organizations seats, it would be the neighborhoods in that district. Thank you. Any other questions, committee members? I don't see any questions. I, hopefully we address most of the concerns. Um, maybe there'll be an opportunity for individuals to talk to staff or uh, committee members later if they have more questions. Well, I'm prepared to um, move the recommendation. Appreciate people coming in and making their comments. In some ways, it would have been maybe good to get some information or some thought in the future. And I also will just make one comment. I would like to see us really think about how the neighborhood elections take place and do that in a different manner. Um, I've had this idea that I don't know that it's, it's resonated well with anybody, and I don't even think I originated the idea. But could we hold the election maybe a different kind of open election and do it at the same time as we're doing our um, community connections conference and have something in the afternoon where we call it a neighborhood congress or something and get people to come in and have a little candidate forum and try to get more interest um, going in that and a better process. Um, but that's also something I'd like to see the NCEC, the commission, actually lead on and come forward with. And I'm thinking maybe that's part of some of the work that you're doing. I don't know that we're going to take comments um, because it's our turn to talk now, um, Marcia, but maybe we can talk later. No, I, unless you really love the idea, just kidding. Um, Andrew had a comment though. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just based off my question on the attendance issue that I know was raised today, I think it, if my message back to NCEC would be, uh, if there are those concerns, certainly bring them to the council, raise them to, uh, obviously we have one member today raising that concern in the public hearing. And, you know, I am hesitant to make any decision against somebody here who hasn't had an opportunity as well to respond to that and who is within the rules uh, on NCEC. But certainly I think if NCEC as a body has a concern with one of their members, that's something we'd like to hear about. So just going forward and not necessarily even with this particular individual, but, you know, as Council Member Gordon mentioned, there's a, a lot of great candidates that apply for this, and I think there's a lot of folks that want to be engaged and participate uh, in this. And so, certainly, you know, that's what we want and expect of the body. And so, if there are individuals who aren't ever in the future, uh, it's something that I think there's opportunities for others who maybe uh, are interested in uh, doing that level of participation and really uh, giving it. They're all, and that's again no comment on this particular individual, but just speaking broadly to the concerns overall, all about participation. Thank you, Councilmember Schrader. Well, just to follow up with uh, Councilmember Johnson, I, I'd be open to approving two and um, delaying um, number two um, until we have a little bit more time to talk. And when we talked as a committee um, for the appointment. Um, we, we talked about the great need for, for gender diversity uh, on the commission, and that's something that uh, we took very, very seriously and also talked about this, uh, all the other contributions each of the candidates made, and the, that was a factor in this as well. I think the concerns are, are serious for attendance, but I, I think if we have one cycle to look into that, that would be good if others were open to that. I think I'd prefer just to move it forward if you're asking for <laughs> preferences rather than hold one back and the others. I do recall that we had some discussion and we were also talking about racial balance and we were also talking about geographic balance and we were, we were looking at the wards. One of the things we had actually was a, a grid and a chart and so we could understand where everybody was coming from. And um, we didn't talk much about attendance but we did talk about um, outreach and engagement and involving others. and. I also am saying this in part because I do recall some strong feelings from the committee chair uh, on this appointment too, 
and um, and it seemed like he probably helped contribute to getting us a, a consensus around this as the choice. So I prefer to stick with the uh, motion from the um, subgroup that brought this forward, um, but that doesn't mean other things couldn't happen in the meantime. So I mean, you can move it as an amendment, and we can take a vote on it as well. But I thought I'd just throw that in there. Go ahead, Councilman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I'm just to respond to that. I'm. I'm I'm open to just approving because we did have that long discussion. Just we had that behind closed doors. So I appreciate you adding a lot more. And you know, with second that you know the chair definitely had some uh, made some very good points. And part of my delaying was to talk a little bit more there. But if you're looking at approving all of it, I I could go along with that. All right. I don't see any more discussion. So maybe we're ready to vote on this. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, three coming forward recommendations for the neighborhood and community engagement commission appointments, say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Any abstentions? That motion carries. Um, and it's, it's, it's good that there's some interest and that there's some discussion about it. And maybe that'll help us do a better job next round too. Thank you for coming and speaking. Um, oftentimes we have public hearings on these appointments and nobody comes in to speak. So this is it's significant and we'll remember. And, you, um, and hopefully we can even talk further later outside of the committee. So we have one last item on our agenda. And this is, um, a report uh, or an overview, I guess, a draft update to the city's comprehensive plan. And uh, is Ms. Worthington going to tee us up? This is um, great that this is coming forward. Um, there's a draft comprehensive plan, Minneapolis 2040, that's been out for a while, and now each committee is getting a chance to look at the policies that relate to the committee. So we've got uh, a bunch of things to think about in our committee here. Welcome. Thank you, Council Member. <clears throat> Council Members, I'm I'm going to kind of set the table here and then ask uh, Brian Schaefer to come up and give you um, a little bit more analysis here. I just wanted to, um, and you're the first committee that we presented to, so you'll hear this multiple times, and for that I apologize. <clears throat> but I just wanted to um, let you know a little bit of, about the process of arriving at a draft uh, for this very important document. We had about 150 staff from around the enterprise involved in uh, research committees over the past 18 months. And um, they were really the drivers behind what you read in the plan um, that is not directly related to land use. Um, and some of those items are related to your committee today. And so we wanted to take a, <clears throat> excuse me, a little deeper dive. Um, the draft itself, just again, to kind of set the table, it has a small number of land use policies that can really become regulatory per statute in the requirements for a comprehensive plan, but a much longer list of policy statements that support those land use policies and are really interconnected. So when we talk about housing, we're also necessarily talking about transportation and we're talking about land use, children, for instance, um, and housing and employment. So um, those are some an example of some of the interconnected um, policy statements that are in the document. So today we'd like to present some of those policy statements that are specific to this committee's work and as they relate to the draft land use work that's in front of you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to just quickly talk about um, a couple of slides here before Brian comes up. Um, you know, this is really the underpinning of the entire um, section that's related to this committee's work. Um, these social and economic disparities which underpin health disparities from premature death rates to access to healthy food and from healthy youth development to housing stability. And I'll just embroider that a little bit. As you know, housing stability is one of the major drivers behind um, childhood educational attainment. And we know that um, too many kids in Minneapolis do not have housing that is stable for them throughout their uh, educational career. So that's one example of some of the data that informs this work and um, can guide how it interacts with our land use regulations. And then I want to um, show you the next slide. This is really kind of trying to illustrate for you how these policy statements and policy directions are interrelated across the document itself. And just trying to illustrate, for each committee we'll do this, but trying to illustrate um, how this document reads as a whole and not just as a chapter by chapter kind of approach. And I think this is um, a little bit more nuanced, but um, you understand as policymakers um, being asked to do this work all the time, how these issues and topics are interrelated. 
And so that's what we're going to take a little deeper dive into today. So I'm going to ask Brian to come up and um, walk you through that. Thank you. Vice Chair Gordon, uh, committee members, I'll spend a few minutes just going through a few more slides and we'll open up for questions and kind of just look for any feedback or dialogue you want to have going forward. So one of the major elements um, that we want to focus on is just how environmental justice and especially in land use can um, connect. Um, and we want to just connect one of those dots for you today. Um, the environmental justice policy sets a really broad statement. It says establish environmental justice frameworks for policy and regulations. So it's about as broad in, of a framework you can have around that. Um, and so what does that mean as it starts to relate to land use specifically, but also recognizing environmental justice is so much more than just um, some of these land use components, everything from equity and anti-displacement policies and, and discussions we have around housing issues, air quality and water qu and soil quality, um, access to healthy food, which we'll get into today, and obviously the health and energy of a home. So there's a broad set um, of this. A lot of that work has been carried forward by Green Zones. Kelly Muhlman is here today who's been working on the Southside Green Zone process. Um, we can talk more about that. But as we start thinking about that in relation to the um, land use goal of production and processing, I wanted to just identify some of those dot, that dot connection for you, is that in the production and processing area, we really call out different action steps. And one of those action steps is that we want to prioritize the use of our um, land and production processing. These are areas that were formerly, we've called industrial. For the for certain types of uses that are have minimal or no impact in air, air water, and noise qual, um, pollution, and that provide a quality living wage job. So we're trying to better position these areas that we formerly called industrial um, to do a lot more for us as a city, both in job creation, but also recognizing that we want to move away from some of those heavy industrial uses and really move into a kind of a new 21st century manufacturing and production and processing type of use. Um, in relation to that, and as we start talking about environmental justice and those impacts from a pr uh, production process, is also, we say, to identify and limit new heavy industrial uses um, that have harm to human health and throughout the city. This relates to a lot of the work that we've done in our land use tables that we can do. Would, this would guide us forward in a zoning ordinance revisions. But it also starts speaking to some of the work that our um, um, partners in um, public health are doing around some of the clean um, grants for clean um, industry and cleaning up industries, everything from uh, um, dry cleaners to heavier industrial uses. So it gets back to tying, some of the dying, tying those dots both between our land use and what we're allowing and what we're trying to achieve um, throughout. Making a kind of a broad switch um, is really starting to talk about more of our food access and land use. And this is a pretty um, significant topic. Um, and there's really two ma main components to healthy food access. One, obviously, I think most of you know in this room is proximity to stores that sell healthy food. Um, and then secondly is insufficient income or enough sufficient income to purchase that food. So both having the economic prosperity and ability to acquire and pay for food um, and as well as accessing that. And there's 11 census tracts within the city that um, are considered um, priority areas that don't have um, healthy access to food in today. Um, and many of these areas are areas where residents live at least a, a mile from a full story, uh, service grocery store. Um, and there's a greater number of census tracts that don't have a grocery store within a half mile. So we're trying to create a way as we start to think about our land use policies is trying to identify opportunities for no, new stores to be created, new sites to open up. We've had a little bit of a stronger policies in the past about restricting commercial growth into really tight nodes and, uh, and portions of corridors. And we're looking at that a little bit more broadly in our future land use map. So our, our policy called access to goods and services, one of the action steps highlighted here is to designate additional areas, and actually we do that in the um, land use plan or in the land use map. Um, that need for or the demand for retail is greater than um, the su current supply, and so how can we allow for that more access to those goods and services? And at the same time, we want to make sure that we pair this with our policies, as um, Heather was mentioning, that are about the access to food itself, and really about the policy network that we did that aren't just land use specific, but really about how all these things are together as an ecosystem, and talk about the proactively trying to get new grocery stores into areas. So you see this up on their screen today. Uh, action step C from the food access policies kind of fits in with this other pol um, the policy and access to commercial goods and services, which is looking at ways to act attract new grocery stores. So how can we be out there actually trying to fill those gaps, not just by creating land use policy to support those locations, but also creating city actions to go find retail or uh, grocery stores, create those spaces to allow it to happen. 
Um, so this is a place when we're starting to think about how this comes together. Those are just two examples of really kind of connecting those two dots. There's some much broader examples of that we can get into um, with any questions or discussion. And I think just really kind of wrapping it up is, you know, next steps moving forward is we're looking to end our public comment period on July 22nd, um, which is in a couple weeks. Uh, we'll be releasing a new draft of the, re of the plan, a revised draft at the end of uh, September. At the end of October, there'll be a planning commission public hearing um, on the um, draft of the plan and then moving into December for a city council action. So that's kind of our trajectory. Um, we wanted to kind of stay at a high level just to connect some of those points to you with you today and then spend the rest of the time answering any questions you may have or having a discussion with you. So with that, I can bring up Paul Mogish, who's also here, and Heather, and we can answer questions as you see fit. And I'm certainly willing to um, take some time on this if folks want to. Maybe I'll just start by asking a question based on this last slide. Um, and I was really hoping it would be mid or early September. Um, so, because uh, <clears throat> the first time I've seen it spelled out in black and white quite like that, but getting it in September would be great. And then my question is, um, is um, C CPAD planning on doing any community engagement um, after the release of the last draft beyond um, providing it, I guess, to the public, hopefully in a uh, PDF searchable format as well as in an electronic one? Because I also see that the, the city, um, I mean, it's the council could own some of that community engagement and we could even get help from our other department uh, departments, including, including community engagement, so um, and do more of that too, but I'm not quite sure what the plan is right now, so I'd like to hear more. Uh, council Member Gordon, Council Members, um, we, we will try to get that out as early as we can in September, but we would like to give ourselves adequate time to revise it um, so that it is a complete draft uh, for the final document. Um, in terms of community engagement, uh, we will have uh, a strategy around that later this summer. Um, that we will share with you. Uh, we don't have a very um, large amount of time between the final draft and um, the, the end of the year, but we will certainly do engagement around the final draft and we will have a communication strategy around it so that um, we're communicating clearly with residents about changes that were made. And as we've said before, we will issue a redlined copy of the draft, um, the final draft plan, and it will be uh, online and a PDF. So. Um, both both formats for that. Excellent. Did I get everything? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate that. Are there questions or comments anybody else wants to make? There's certainly a lots of uh, items um, that the committee is going to touch on. Council Member Schrader. Yeah, just a quick one. I'm, mm -hmm. I have more questions for another committee. Okay. Uh, but on this one, just to follow up on like late September for the release date, mm -hmm. I know they've been getting a lot of comments like, are you on pace? to make late September mm -hmm. do with everything and just absolutely fantastic yes we want to give you and the Planning Commission plenty of time to look at an updated draft so yeah so I guess I have a, a question or maybe just a comment mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate that environmental justice has a policy wrapped around it I guess I was um, was surprised that we didn't actually have green zones mentioned in the policy we kind of talk about that I think one of the things that we could really do in the next few years is take the green zones um, resolution and the work that's been done and it was almost like a uh, build as you go process to understand it better even even um, kind of passing the resolution and deciding we're going to start some green zones and then it took us a long time to figure out actually where would the first one be and it was so hard we ended up choosing two um, and now I think we're going to, if we're going to keep, well, we should figure out as a city, are we going to keep using this as a tool? How effective has it been? Where is it going to go? I, I, I did notice that Green Zone does appear under another uh, policy um, having to do with um, green business uh, incentives. Uh, I think it was, I can't remember now which policy it was, but it did appear. So um, I just wanted to raise that comment and it, and maybe even obviously perhaps by now, um, expressing a little bit of an opinion that maybe it should be called out a little more clear, clearly right as one of the things about environmental justice is we're going to refine and, and, and use this strategy better. Uh, Vice Chair Gordon, I think that's a great idea. I think one of the things we wrestled with when we were bringing up this is this is a 10-year plan. 
Um, and as such, we don't, we've been kind of trying to stay just above detailing specifically specific policy programs for that purpose, whether, you know, as you said, if green zones become something different and morphs, um, making sure that we both have the policy background to support it, which I think we do. Actually, I think if you break down green zones and the work that's been done, which is fantastic, there's it lives in many of the different policy categories and discussions. Um, just identified two of those today, but there's yeah, dozens of others. So we have the policy background, even though we don't may, may not call it green zone. So that's a that's a conversation we've had internally a lot about is where do we stop from calling out specific um, policy program or pro specific programs. And, but giving us enough direction of connectivity and program and policy support. So I, I think that's a place we can probably for, spend more time working through that. And, and I would only add that um, there are a number of policy documents that the city has had in place previous to this um, updated comprehensive plan, like the climate action plan, for instance, um, that need to be referenced into this document so that this kind of becomes a, um, a document that has some standalone features and also some reference features. So that might be a, a good place for the green zones work um, to reside is as a reference to this so that it can continually be updated um, while this is a little bit more of a static document over a 10 year period. So just understanding kind of how these documents interrelate and inform each other. Well, I appreciate that. And as somebody who's been here for a while and fought hard to get some of those policies passed, you don't want to think they're all of a sudden going to disappear because and, and one way to make sure they're not disappearing is have them somehow called out in the comp plan or inform that. Another one that I was thinking about was the urban ag um, policy mm -hmm. plan. So we did a lot of these even through land use and zoning and planning. Um, these topical plans, we call them, I think. That, um, and one of them was on the urban ag policy. And of course, when we, we passed kind of the policy plan and then we chose some things to implement that we thought were doable. And now I have a hunch a few years later, seeing how popular some of the things were and uh, there might be some of those other recommendations that would pass now that we didn't think could then because they seem too extreme. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to lose that either. Right. I also really think that the comp plan could help us understand better um, with the value of land used to grow food. So there's, there's a lot of stuff in the plan about access to food and grocery stores and retailing and processing. Um, but I think it's a big, it's a, it's been a big leap for a lot of people to say we're actually going to allow food farming, food production, and growth agriculture in the city, and now we are allowing it in small scale, large scale, and I think it could be a way to answer the problem of food access, also healthier food. I also think there might be a lot of um, private land that could grow food, and people might be willing to have their land grow food on it, and even if they don't do it themselves. And then also we're going to hit these dilemmas where we have a piece of land that could produce a lot of food, or maybe it's a rooftop, and maybe it's the wall of a building, but whatever, but especially if it's a plot of land, and then we're going to say, oh no, a higher use is something else. And, and if we had something in our comp plan that could say, um, nope, a certain amount of, we know we have enough housing, we'll know we'll have enough job mm -hmm. land, and we can still have land set aside for parks and recreation and baseball and soccer, and for food production, I think that would be helpful. And I know we won't actually probably have a percentage of how many acres per per person or whatever, um, but that's something, uh, and I know there's a lot of good stuff on food in here, but it, it most of it wasn't on actual growing food. I actually think as a home-based business, mm -hmm. if somebody could lease out some of their home, but then they might have actually somebody else working it. And so are we gonna look the other way uh, or are we gonna, carve out some special rules so we can actually do that um, in terms of resilience as a city and also in terms of um, co the cost of food. Um, mm -hmm. Those kinds of things could be addressed in this small way. This food topic also fits nicely into the production and processing area of the comprehensive plan. So thinking about food production in ways that's other than growing food in dirt, um, thinking about growing food hydroponically and other um, maybe more technology-driven food production. Um, and, and that's another example of living wage job creation, production and processing land use, um, and, and ways to use land um, in a more efficient way, perhaps. So that's a, yeah, it's a perfect, it's a perfect discussion at, about transcending different uh, topical areas of the, the document itself. And there's probably more comments that I could make, but I'll uh, try not to go on and on with my 
several have other opportunities as well. Are there other questions that any other committee members have? Comments? All right, well, we're going to have a chance to talk about Thank all you. this a little bit more uh, this fall, I guess. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think our only action on this then is to receive and file this overview. I will move that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. That motion carries. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for being here. <laughs>